Hi guys, we're going to talk about chapter eight. This is going to really involve therapeutic relationships. When we talk about therapeutic relationship, we are talking about creating a space where caring and healing can occur. Encounters can occur in any nursing setting and a nurse needs to be sensitive to the needs of the de client by developing a rapport by using effective communication. So let's get started here. How do we build that nurse patient foundation? The foundation must be solid in order to develop the relationship. This list on this slide helps build the relationship. Patients don't have the choice to be there, so treating them with dignity and respect is vital. We may do some information sharing. Um, we may have patient and family participation. We're gonna collaborate and we're gonna make sure we have clear and appropriate boundaries to build that nurse patient foundation. We have talked before that we will have a very unique personality traits and talents. We can learn to use creativity to form bonds with others. When we use these traits and talents to promote healing in others, that's referred to as therapeutic use of self. A positive therapeutic alliance is a collaborative and respectful. It's one of the best predictors of a positive outcome. When we're building those healthy relationships, we can also think about Maslow. Remember, we talked about Maslow last week as one of the theorists. <clears throat> and on that basic level or that level one, basic human needs are met. Food, water, shelter, sleep are very real needs for people. And the first need that needs to be met. Level two, we move up safety and security. This comes from consistency and predictability. Level three is healthy relationships. People build and experience healthy relationships only when they feel safe and secure and have those basic human needs met. Level four is that achievement. This is when one can finally relax and have a little bit of fun. And then level five is self-actualization. So just like um, Maslow says, when we're building those healthy relationships, we have to assess the needs of that patient. What are any unmet needs? Determine those and then make sure we're finding any de-escalation strategies so that we're not um, escalating our patients so they are able to get those needs met. It is important of prevention. People who behave in part to get their needs met, when we are able to help people get their needs met, it's much less likely that they will use behaviors to get those needs met. When people's needs are not met, they're gonna increase the frequency, intensity, and duration of their behavior to get those needs met. Radar, this isn't in your book, but I thought it was something kind of interesting that I found. Um, it's in, all human beings have their own radar, which we use to assess potential threats. It's important to understand the process of performing a threat assessment so we can maintain our safety and the safety by others or safety of others by understanding and maintaining an awareness of the common ways in which we assess threats then we can more easily manage our own behaviors to perceived as being less threatening to others so when we think about radar r is recognize so observe that what's going on Something has changed. A, we're gonna assess. Make sure you assess yourself, other people, and that environment. D, we're gonna decide. We need to determine what are we gonna do to intervene. A, we're gonna act. This is a respond, not just a reaction. And then R, we're gonna review those results. Was it successful? Was the situation diffused? Did you have a resolution? When we use radar, we can recognize, assess, decide, and act quickly if any situation is escalating due to some type of threat made or threat perceived. The importance of talk therapy, a formalized approach to talk therapy that is based on theoretical models is called psychotherapy. This is usually pre 
performed by an advanced practice registered nurse. Evidence shows <clears throat> that psychotherapy within a therapeutic partnership actually changes brain chemistry in much of the same way as medication. Therefore, best treatment for most psychiatric problems is a combination of medication and psychotherapy. A therapeutic nurse-patient relationship has goals and functions that can include <clears throat> facilitating communication of distressing thoughts and feelings, assisting our patient with problem solving, helping our patient examine self-defeating behaviors, promoting self-care and independence, and providing education about disorders and treatments. An additional goal is promoting recovery. Recovery is a process that begins with diagnosis and the eventual management of the condition. It's, in, it's an important aspect to recovery, including empowerment and increasing family and social support. A relationship is an interpersonal process that involves two or more people. These relationships can be categorized as intimate, personal, or therapeutic. Intimate relationships occur when people have an emotional commitment to each other. Clearly, there are moral and ethical concerns about intimate relationships with our patients and most certainly legal and professional restrictions. So we're going to really just focus on the difference between personal and therapeutic relationships. So when we talk about personal relationships, it's initiated for the purpose of friendship, socialization, enjoyment, or accomplishing a task. Mutual needs are met during these social interactions. Communication skills may include giving advice and meeting basic dependency needs, such as lending money or helping with jobs. Often, <clears throat> the content of communication is very superficial. In a therapeutic relationship, the nurse maximizes communication skills, understanding of human behaviors and personal strengths to enhance the patient's growth. It needs the, the needs of the patient <coughs> excuse me, um, are identified and explored. There's clear boundaries that are established. Problem solving approaches are taken. New coping skills are developed and behavioral changes are encouraged. This does not mean that the nurse is not friendly, but it does mean that talking about everyday topics is discouraged. Small amount of self-disclosure on the nurse's part may strengthen that therapeutic relationship. Relationship boundaries and roles is the next thing we're gonna kind of talk about. Boundaries can be considered the edge of professional behaviors and exist to protect the patient. Nurses are expected to maintain professional boundaries and help patients meet their goals and never cross boundaries for goal personally met, being met for the nurse. The expected and accepted legal, ethical, and professional standards that separate nurses from patients. It provides a safe space for our patient. When we think about legal boundaries, Patient's right to confidentiality, breach of confidentiality is a common law tort, which is a civil wrong. The wrong can result in a lawsuit resulting in monetary damages. Sexual misconduct violates all of those. When patient-centered care falls to too much care, then over-involvement can increase the risk of boundary crossing, boundary violations, professional sexual misconduct, and blurring of roles. When we talk about boundary crossing, this is when the relationship slips into a personal context and the nurse's needs, either for attention, affection, or emotional support are met at the expense of the patient's needs. When we talk about boundary violations, this takes advantage of the patient's vulnerability and are ethically um, characterized by a reversal of roles where the needs again of the nurse are being met rather than the patient. 
um, professional sexual misconduct. This is physical or verbal breach of contract, but that might include expressions of feelings and thoughts or gestures that are sexual or could reasonably be interpreted by the patient as sexual. When we talk about blurring of roles, it is often due to unrecognized transparency or counter transparency. And we've brought up this terminology before, but remember that transparency is when the patient unconsciously and inappropriately displaces onto nurses' feelings and behaviors related to significant figures in the patient's past. Common forms of transference include the desire or for affection or respect and gratification of dependency needs. Counter-transference is transference again in reverse. So the nurse is unconsciously displacing feelings related to significant figures in the nurse's past that onto the patient. So common signs of counter-transference in nurse is over-identification with that patient. It can often result in over-involvement and, and can impair that therapeutic relationship. Nurses are trained to perform clinical assessment on patients, but they're not typically trained to know and understand themselves. <clears throat> in psychiatric nursing, Self-awareness is a key component to forming a therapeutic relationship. We all have likes and interests that we are aware of, and it's easier to not let a difference in what we like interfere with our ability to provide care. More sacred to us than likes or dislikes are our values and beliefs. It's easier to become more threatened by others who possess different values and beliefs. So as nurses, it's helpful to realize that our values and beliefs reflect our own culture or subculture. They're derived from a range of choices and they're chosen from a variety of influences and role models. Those chosen values stem from religious, cultural and societal forces. Our values guide us in making decisions and taking action that we hope will make our lives meaningful, rewarding, and fulfilled. Being self-aware helps us to accept the uniqueness and difference in others. So just a review, um, Peplau, Peplau is the theorist that followed Sullivan and expanded on his theories to establish and introduce that nurse-patient relationship. Hopefully, Peplau is a familiar name now for you. This relationship consisted of a nurse having skills and expertise to alleviate suffering, find solutions, and explore different avenues to increase quality of life for our patients. So Peplau described that nurse-patient relationship that evolved through phases, pre-orientation, orientation, working, and termination. So let's look at Phases. Pre-orientation phase begins with preparing for your assignment. This means we're going to research our patient's history. We're going to recognize our own thoughts and feelings about meeting this patient, and we're going to anticipate us in setting ground rules before that first meeting. The orientation phase can last for a few meetings to a very extended period of time. This is where you meet your patient. You establish rapport by demonstrating empathy, genuineness, and being consistent with problem solving assistance and providing that support. A formal or informal contract is reviewed with patient and contains the place, time, date, and duration of the meeting. The patient has the right to know what information will be shared and who it's going to be shared with and that information will not be shared with relatives, friends, or staff outside the patient treatment team, except in a very extreme condition. As we move into the working phase of the nurse-patient relationship, we continue to maintain our rapport. The patient is allowed to safely express themselves. This is where we can identify and explore areas causing problems. We can educate our patient and help them become more familiar with biological factors 
and psychological factors to help them understand their treatment regimen. This also helps your patient learn and prepare them to take an active role in their own care and recovery. The termination phase is that final integral phase of that nurse-patient relationship. Basic tasks of this phase include summarizing goals and objectives that have been achieved, discuss ways for patients to incorporate new coping strategies learned, review situations of the relationship, ex and exchange some memories. Termination phase often awakens very strong feelings in both the nurse and the patient. This phase signifies a loss for both, although the intensity and meaning could be very different for both. So being aware of how the patient is taking the loss of the relationship can be very vital for that nurse. So what are some factors that promote patient growth? Genuineness is the ability for the nurse to be open, honest, and authentic. This builds trust. Genuineness is conveyed by listening and communicating clearly with patients. Empathy, this can be defined as temporarily trying to live in the other's life, moving about in it delicately without making judgment. When we distinguish between empathy and sympathy, this means we're able to understand the feelings of others. That's empathy versus feeling pity or sorrow for others. That's sympathy. A sympathetic response may say, <clears throat> I feel so bad for you. I know how close you are to your mom. Where an empathetic response would be more of an attitude that conveys respect, acceptance, and validation. This must be devastating for you. It must seem so unfair. So you can see the difference in our empathetic response and our sympathetic response. Positive regard implies respect. This can be accomplished through your attitude and your actions. Our attitude might convey positive regard or respect and willingness to work with the patient. Actions that manifest an attitude of respect are attending, suspending value judgment, and helping patients develop resources. Attending is a special kind of listening that refers to an intensity of presence or being with the patient. At times, simply being with another person during a painful time can make a difference. Posture, eye contact, and body language are, on, are all nonverbal behaviors that reflect the degree of attending and are highly culturally influenced. Our ultimate goal is building a positive, healthy relationship and that can happen with respect, honesty, and trust. And that concludes chapter eight. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we can chat about it in class. Thanks guys.